Uh, good afternoon. Welcome back to Madcast episode four. Uh, wherever you're listening, it's great. Uh, it's great to be back on air here. And uh, again, I've got two fabulous people with me tonight. Um, one from London and one from Derry. Uh, two different, two different places. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, from 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 London. Firstly, we have Anouk Hayes. Uh, Hello. Anouk, you've been with me on a couple of casts so far, and. Uh, you're, you're a permanent fixture now, and it's great to have you. You're, you're, a, you're a bundle of information, and you're, and you're great to work with. You're very welcome back. Thank um, you. You have a keen interest in football as well, which will yes. be interesting tonight because we have, we have with us from, from Derry, um, without question, probably Derry's finest ever footballer, um, the, the one and only Liam Coyle. Liam, you're very, very welcome. Hey, Martin. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, buddy. It's been a while. Um, I was just I was just thinking back there when 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 was it we done college together? I think it was about two thousand and seven, was it? It was, yep, yep. So that's thirteen years ago, yeah. I mean, where does that? Okay, time go? See, it feels like yesterday, Martin, but it was I think, thirteen. It like years. Yesterday, Liam. It was a good, it was a good time. We done a year in Oakland College. Um, we actually done a, a certificate in counselling studies together, which right. was, uh, for me a taster. And I'm just the beginning of my journey. I'm 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 still. I would. I was at school for the next eight years after that. I think so. I'm only really getting kind of finished up at it. Uh, but it was a great time, and it was a great introduction for me to Derry as well, to the city, and to the people up there. Uh, met some, made some good friends, and still have some good friends up there. Even from that class, I remember Big Michael, Big Michael Doherty. Do you remember Liam? I, talk, I, chat to, I do chat to, to Michael an odd time as well. So um, I was to spend four years, I think, in total in college in the tech there. You know, so. Really enjoyed my time. Got to know the people. Got to know the city. There's a there's a there's a there's a real sort of edge about Derry. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really great city in so far as it's you know I, I find it very real, and the people are very real and very genuine. You know, um, they're a wee bit clannish until you get to know them, Liam. Would that be fair? Yeah, well, that's a fair fair point, Martin. You know, as you say, you know, it's um, very diverse city at the minute. You know what I mean? And and people are. They're moving on from what what they went through a lot in in the seventies and eighties, you know. So um, I think the, the city has come on leaps and bounds, you know, over the last fifteen twenty years. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's fabulous, and and I mean the like the Peace Bridge and everything there. It's it's been it's been fantastic. It's post really since the Good Friday Agreement because Derry would have been in the city's one of the cities that was hardest hit by the troubles. Uh, it was. I, I think the troubles and uh, unemployment here in the in the 70s and 80s was was rife you know and um, there was very little about and, and it's not the city if you you know you go back uh, like I can remember it in, with, in, in my lifetime it, it, it's still very clear to me you know and I can remember how how sparse and spartan the city was you know and um, mm. and they look at it now thriving you know apart from this coronavirus was it's you know yeah the dampener on things at the minute but you know, I'm sure we've come through a lot in the past. I'm sure we'll come through this as well. Come through it again. You were born in 68, I think. You have a couple of years on me. You're a couple of years younger. <laughs> 68, I was born, Martin, yeah. Um, born in the Brandwell. Well, I was, was born, born not in the Galvin, but I was raised in, in the Brandywell area of the, the city, you know. Yeah. You were you were, you were were in the shadow of the Brandywell. Well, right across. Like my, our house, my house was right on the halfway line of the Brandywell, you know. Right. Our, our, uh, before they built the, the what they call the South End Park stand now, our right. house over, just overlooked the Brandwell, you know, right, right on the, uh, under the halfway line, you could see both sides of the pitch, you know, so I was on there to every opportunity over the wall right. playing football, you know. So you couldn't really miss then when you were so close, you, you, were, you were destined to become a candy stripe then? Well, I, I wouldn't say I was destined because Derry at that time were put out of the league in 1972 because uh, they were put out of the Irish League in 1972 because um, there was a bus burnt uh, in the Brandwell area by, I don't know if it was Derry fans or not, you know, at that time the troubles, it just started to take hold, you know, um, Bloody Sunday ha had just happened and um, they were put out of the league for 13 years and they tried to get back into the league for, for a long time but um, I wasn't. I, I played local football, but I went to Nottingham Forest when I was very young. I went to Nottingham Forest when I was 12. They were 16. So, you know, Derry, Derry still weren't on senior football at that time. So I was still trying to make my way 
trying to go to England. You know, I yeah. would, they weren't on the horizon for me at all. So, mm. um, I, obviously because of the connection where I'm from, where I'm from, and because mm. my father played there in the sixties, people yeah. always have that thing. Way, but for me, it was it was a tough enough journey. Mm. So I suppose because your father had had the background and played for Forest and, and played for, for Northern Ireland as well, I suppose you were more drawn then to the soccer maybe than you were to the GAA. Well, GAA was never a, never a thing, Martin and Derry. You know, right. that's uh, it was more of a county Derry thing than right. uh, than the, the city. You know, and uh, yeah. there was very like I don't ever remember anybody playing Gaelic. Okay. And uh, in, in, in the city, like you, you had Celtic Park, obviously. Celtic Park was run down. Okay. Um, at that stage, you know, it was just it was lying in, in, in ruin, and there was nobody using it. I think the only school in Derry really played uh, GA was, was St Columns College, you know. Right. And uh, I went to the Christian Brower School, St Peter's. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, sorry, I went to Long Tower School, primary school, which didn't play Gaelic, played played soccer. And then by the time I got the um, St. Peter's Secondary School, the Christian Blowers, the Christian Blowers were sort of moving away. So the Gaelic had gone out of that as well too, you know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. so soccer, f- football, like, you know, as we call it here, was was the only thing for mm-hmm. for a majority of young people in Derry, really, yeah. to do. Did you ever give it a go at all, Liam? I, I did, Martin. I played it once. Um, the, the the school decided one time they, they maybe started it up uh, and we played... Um, St. Collins College, who were the best team in right. uh, the north at the time, and I think they beat us 85 0. <laughs> I don't even think we had a, 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 a point over the bar, you know what I mean? Right. So okay. I think by that stage, I'd realized that GA wasn't for me, like, you know. Mm-hmm. Very good. But it was uh, like, you know, one of my best friends, and uh, I met through. Thing was Anthony Tohill, you know, who played yes, played for Derry, like you know, Anthony played at Derry for, uh, for a year with me, and you know, and I and I got to know Anthony really well, and what a f- fantastic person, you know what I mean? Mm. And um, he gave me an insight, and, and they wanted to talk, you know, because like you know, them players weren't getting paid or anything, you know, so yeah. the the dedication and their and their uh, their will just to play a sport that they love was was yeah. fantastic for me to hear, you know. Sure, yeah. I just read today that uh, locally the games are supposed to be coming back on the 17th of July or they're, they're allowed to sort of play from then on. So it's great to see it's great to see all of the sports coming back, although yep. hopefully they all come back safely. I think that's that's the big one. But uh, That's the main thing, yep. Yeah, as long as we can, you know, we all missed our football and, and stuff. But, uh, you know, and, and when you talk about the GA and those lads are, are amateurs out there and, you know, you don't want those guys or, or the professionals putting themselves on the line and it's all about safety, but um, it is definitely good to see the sports back for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just on your, I mean, Anouk, you were, you wanted to ask Liam something about about his dad in terms of you were you done a bit of research on on Faye, didn't you? I think. I well, first of all, please forgive me. I have to say this: you are legendary. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> You've never heard that before, have I haven't you? Haven't heard that. That's that's a first. That's brand new. Um, but it's more of a family legend as well, isn't it? It's more of a, I mean, it, it, one would, one would not be surprised to make the assumption that you went into football because of your father, who was hugely successful. I mean, he really was legendary. It was, yep. Would you say that? I think, I think, I think think you're right. I think. I think football in Derry in, in the, the 70s and 80s and it was, you know, was your brothers, your older brothers or your father played, you know. And um, for me, I, I, you're, you're right, my father, like, you know, I, I had to hear all the stories about my father from other people. My father himself never spoke about anything, you know. You know he played at the World Cup in 1958. At the time, Pele made his debut for Brazil. You know, he played, he played at that World Cup for Northern Ireland. But I had to hear how it went from different people because my father was so private and quiet and, and stuff right. like that. So I think it was just a natural progression because he played and like I had two, three, three brothers and two of them played as well. They were very good footballers growing up, but they just never right. made the step going on. But I was the last and I was the youngest of the four boys. So maybe, you know, my father had retired at that stage and stuff like that. So maybe in more time, you know, for myself, like they, they, they what, helped. What me. sort of what sort of player was he? What what kind he, of 
was how did, was, did he keep his head down and do the work? Did he was he showboating? Was he the what, what kind of player? Well, my he? my four was a center forward. He scored all the goals. You know, he was he was um he was very you know people say I was very like him. That's that's a lazy thing. You know, it looks lazy on the pitch. You know, I mean, me and him sort of the same gate, same way we walked, same way we played. You know, for coming, from, I I never seen my father play football at all. Right. You know, even even when he stopped playing, I never even seen him play, play in a charity game or things like that. But from what I'm led to believe, he was just he was just a genius. Mm-hmm. Like you know, for his time, you know, way way mm-hmm. ahead of his time at that stage. But I think my father he got to know him a bit better before he died. That the fact that he he, I think he feels that he should have done better. You know, he should have done better. He feels as if he he could have produced more. And you no, know, he went to England and come back after nine months. Mm-hmm. You know, in 1957, and he thinks if he had stayed, he could have made a lot more money and things like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I think um, following on from, I think it's just he, he just as I said before. See, for for us growing up in the 70s and 80s and there there was very little else. He just he had a ball and he would go out the street to play football, you know. Right. And that's where I just kept it going, like, you know. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? You, oh, sorry, Mark, you go. I was, I was going to, sorry, I was just going to say, tell us a little bit about, about that time because, you know, uh, our guest last week, Colin Broderick, uh, who grew up in, in, in Oma, um, he talked, sorry, not in Oma, but in Tyrone, just outside, yeah, outside Oma, but he talked about, about the troubles and the, the, the normality of that, you know. Um, and we were just talking the other day, Arne, uh, Anouk and I, about you know about the um, how that must have been even more intense in a city like Derry. Um, well, uh, but, uh, he, uh, the thing about it, is, Martin, and you you got to realise that see for us it was normal. It was normal, you know, to see army and police, and um, you know, my house could when I was one of a kid, like my house was was raided more times than I cared to think, like you know what I mean, because. You're living in an area where, um, you know, there was a lot of, lot of interest and people like Martin McGinnis lived up the street from me. At that mm-hmm. time, you know, Martin loved uh, it was our, you know, people, you know, was you, you, you were just in the middle of it, and he didn't really know what any, any different of, of what was going on. Like, you know, obviously mm-hmm. there was a lot of things happening. You know, and policemen and soldiers were killed in the area where I lived and stuff like that and and, our, and, and people I know that died around there as well too like you know that were, were in the IRA so you, you know you just get up with it and you get on with it it never really affected you in the way that unless it was really came to your door you know what I mean and that's mm-hmm. I think that's just the way people de- dealt with it and cope with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Didn't really you know, affect- interestingly, interestingly enough, I, I've been to Derry. I'm a huge Christy Moore fan. That's how Martin and I know each other. I'm a massive Christy Moore fan. And I went to Derry and saw him there for two nights. It was fantastic. We had a great time. It's a fantastic city. I, I love it. But I, I own that I saw it as a tourist. So I'm not even going to say anything about it. I loved it there. I'm sure it has its share of problems like London does. Yep. But I, I would have happily stayed there for months. And I took a tour. And I hate to say this, it, it, you know, it's probably one of those naff touristy tours that you probably think, oh, my God, is that what, you know, what do they say in these tours? And we stood at the top of the wall yep. and they sh- and we could see that Brandy well and, and, and the tour guide actually said there is. And round the corner, if you look over there is where Martin McGuinness was he was raised and, and where he lived and no. and we all just went ooh and ah and all this kind of thing. And then they showed us the wall and all, all this sort of thing. But you know what really brought it home to me was I went to the Free Dairy Museum. Yep. And it's run by a chap called John Kelly. Yeah, that's right, John. Yeah, and whose brother, I believe, his his life was taken yeah, on. Bloody that's right. And I am sure John Kelly won't mind me saying this because he said it to me himself. He's very angry. He's he's an angry, he's still angry. And I wonder if you how you feel about about Derry and what you lived through and whether you understand or feel wish that it would you know wish that there would be reparation or reconciliation and that that people who are still angry would not be angry anymore or whether it's right to be still angry 
Yeah, well, see, that, that's the whole thing about, about the troubles in this city. And look, especially the bloody Sunday families who were smeared and they were, you know, for years were, were told that their, that, that their loved ones were, were um, more or less criminals, you know what I mean? And they had to fight long and hard for it. They, 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 and people like, like John and, and all the families, you know, the Dubbies and the McKinney's and everybody else that's involved in it, they're raising it. They, they have every right to feel it. And the whole city felt it. And especially at the time when, um, when the, the British government, you know, uh, put out an apology and accepted that everything that was wrong at that time. I think people are moving on slowly. You know, I think, I think after 20 years, I think, for, as I said before, you know, most people here just got on with, on with things. It was just a normal. You know, we, we keep talking about this normal now we're going to have after coronavirus. For us in the troubles, it was normal. It wasn't, right. it wasn't get up every day and thinking to yourself, I wonder what's going to happen today. You know, we never right. thought, you know, everybody just went to their jobs, went to, went to do the bar, went to clubs or, you know, and, and that's mm-hmm. the way it was. Things happened around me and for ne- never a minute did you think, you know, ah, this is really bothering me as such, you know, and, you no, know, for us growing up in, in the Brandle area, and I don't want to be flippant about this or make it sound as if it was thing, but it was funny at times. You know, it was really funny, and it was, you know, it was a, there was always a dark humour about things. You know, and you had to find humour somewhere in it. But mm-hmm. uh, I think, you know, for all my my family and everybody else growing up, the troubles were just part of our lives. We just it never bothered us in the, in the way that. The people at Bloody Sunday had to live with it all their lives, you know. Mm. Mm. Unfortunately, um, like, and that's and, and that's the thing about. It. I think you're, you're quite right. I think there has to be, there has to be a common together at some stage. I think I, I th- thought we mm-hmm. were getting there. I think, I think when Martin McGinnis was still alive and Martin was still fit, I think it was every chance that we could have done it. I think at the minute, yeah. you know, once Martin left. He left a huge gap, you know, and unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be bridged yet, you know. Mm. Mm. It's an, it's, it's a, it's a deeply interesting psychological dilemma, isn't it? Really, I mean, if you look at it, of course, I would only have experienced the troubles through the eyes of the mainstream media over here, yep. which, as you well know, is incredibly biased, and in, uh, whichever direction they go, they tend to go to the extreme. Um, but I remember thinking, as as a young a young person thinking it never made any sense to me and i can understand yep. that if it doesn't make any sense it must be hard to come to accept to have acceptance because acceptance comes via understanding as well as compassion but it comes via understanding and i wonder if did you ever have moments where you just thought it's normal but what on earth is going on you know what's what's happening to me because of what's around me well, again, you see, I, I, I had a focus growing up that football could have took me, took me away from it, you know, because I had been going all over Northern Ireland or over the South, South playing football and training and stuff, where a lot of people that I grew up with were stuck on it, you know, and they were, they were stuck and, and, and they end up getting involved in, 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 uh, in things that probably look back on now, I'm not saying that they don't regret it, but they probably think, oh, shouldn't have done that or shouldn't have done this, you know what I mean? And and you look at people and, and, and the way it's affected them, you know, um, you look at the area I come from is a high unemployment rate. There's a drinking culture on it. Drugs has found its way into it now. So, mm. you know, it's it's one of them places that maybe, you know, that, uh, there's no doubt about it. No, there, there, you can argue whatever way you want about the, the ins and outs of what was right and what was wrong. You know, for, for everybody in the other area I came from, it was the right thing to do that the IRA were doing, you know what I mean? And that's mm-hmm. that's the way it was. Mm-hmm. You know, if you go up the fountain or over the water side, they'll tell you a different story mm-hmm. or you go to Cragen and stuff, places like that. But mm-hmm. I think that the troubles for a lot of people were, there's a lot of anger involved in it. And, they, you know, you gotta remember, you know, it wasn't that long before Catholics were allowed to vote in this city, like you know, and mm. and uh, I think even up until you know the eighties, where it was still very, very unionist led. Mm. So 
Is it, is it very similar to um, what we see now a lot in the Premier League or in the, in the different leagues over here where young boys, young men, sorry, are saying if it wasn't for the football and the training and having somewhere to go and they would have gone down a different path. Yeah. Do you feel as strongly as that or do you not? Because for some people, well, I, um, I, I think of um, Troy Deeney. Troy Deeney, who's been in prison, plays for Watford. Uh, yeah. Troy Deeney openly you know on the, on the first day when he played uh, when he rolled out for Watford he brought half of his friends that he'd you know been in prison with and, and he said if it wasn't for football I would just be out there gang banging or out there doing the you know whatever you're doing do you feel as strongly about that do you think that, that you were able to football was in some ways just a, a much better different path to take that well, helped you well, well part of it is where, where I come from you know you knew everybody, right? So I had one group of friends who played football. And then I had another group of friends who were on these other things. Right. If you know what I mean. So you would have been out times with one group of friends. And then you would have played your football with your friends. You knew that we're never going to get into trouble. You know what I mean? So right. I could easily have went the other way. There's no question about it. Yeah. There's, no, yeah. there's no way that I could have went. or, or There's no question that I could have said, right, I'm leaving these group behind me and I'm going here because a lot of them felt, you know, as if they were being disenfranchised or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And they felt as if mm. they were being undermined by a government that doesn't support them. And yeah. so they went a different way. There's no question about that. But I felt myself that the fo if I hadn't went down the football road, that I would never have got out of that situation. You know what I mean? I would have been right. stuck on it forever more than a man. And I think yeah. I was lucky enough that the group of friends that I had, we all played football together for, mm. from when we were 10 years of age, they were 17. And, right. and that helped us, you know, so I think, but there's no question, like you could, you could easily have been, you could have been yeah. easily went down a different road all the year. I suppose it's fair to say, Liam, that only, only a few really got out because the opportunities for, for footballers like yourself wouldn't have been that many. So, probably a lot of people would have gone the other road because they wouldn't maybe have had, the, you know, the gift or the talent that you had or, or, or players like you, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Through my own kind of research in recent times as well, I would have done a lot of work on around trauma and, and that. And I would have done, a, you know, a bit of research around Derry in the North in, in terms of mental health and, and suicide, which is, which is a big thing in Derry, sadly, as well, you know. And it always seems to be, and you touched on it there a few minutes ago, you know, areas where there's social and economic deprivation, where there's little or no maybe chance of employment, um, there might be a low educational attainment, that kind of thing, drugs and alcohol as well. So I think it must be very, very difficult. It must have been very difficult back then and probably still is to, to a point because I do notice the figures are still quite high for self-harming and, and, and suicide in, in Derry. I was telling Anouk about, you know, Foil Side Rescue, which is an absolutely brilliant, brilliant organization, you know, but they're, they're busy and they're, you know, because I, I do follow their, their, their social media posts and I mean, they're out every weekend, they're out every night, they're, you know, um, is it fair to say that about what I've just said about uh, these are the reasons why maybe young people, because it, it seems to be the, the, you know, the, the proportion or the, or the, um, you know the people that are doing, are you know attempted suicide are, are like sixteen to thirty five year olds and, and predominantly male. So is that a thing that ties in? Can, can you see the logic in that, or can you? Does that make sense to you? Um, well, it does, Martin. I don't, I don't think it's got anything to do with troubles or anything like that. But I think it's a new generation of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Derry, you would never in the eighties. Early eighties, the late eighties, you've never got drugs in Derry at all. You know what I mean? Okay. We never got drugs. Drugs were, were alcohol was a big thing. Mm -hmm. Alcohol was a massive thing in Derry. It was a big drinking culture in Derry. But as that generation get older, it's a new ones come in now. You know they they must have troubles and okay. you know they they well they must the majority of the troubles. You know what I mean? There's still there's still an element out there that's still trying to drag us back. But I think the majority of it now is. There's no question about it. It's got to do with, when you look at the figures, it's got to do with the area you're coming from or mm. the area you live in. And um, 
you know, places like Cregan and the Brandywell and Gelia and Chantal and places like that where there is, you know, more unemployment and there's more more chance they um, not not they have a chance they, they have your own house and have your own mm. um, family and that a lot of people living on their own. They're, 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 you can blame everything for that, Martins. There's no question about it, like you know what I mean? But I don't think you can level this generation at the troubles, you know what I mean? Okay. Maybe mm. maybe it's mm. a generation thing where they can't bring, bring it on mm-hmm. from their families and that, I don't yeah. know, but... I well, there is, um, there is, there is research that suggests, you know, that there is an intergenerational thing, and even, even as a people across the island of Ireland, you know, I, I would see how we have, we have held on to that eight hundred years of oppression, uh, yeah. and we, we kind of, we, we play on it, and we drink on it, and we sing on it, and we do all of those things. So I think, I think there is, from what I've looked at and what I've researched anyway, that there is a, an element of sorts, or you know, it, it, it takes a long time to get past the legacy of, of, of the violence and, and everything that existed in Derry and Northern Ireland for that well, many years. I'll give you an example, Martin. For a long time, you know, I'm, same as yourself, I'm looking at my big Christy Moore fan. You know, and Christy Moore went off the scene for a long time in Derry because you know, it became a disco thing and it became a club thing. And so over the last six, seven, eight years, you can see traditional music more and more mm-hmm. coming back into the, the culture again and more and more singing songs about the IRA and about this and about that and mm-hmm. you know and you can see see it all coming back again you know mm-hmm. and I don't know if this, this is a thing where it reappears every so mm-hmm. often or whatever it happens but there really is a thing where you know you can see I don't know if it's families talking about it more in, in, in their houses and mm-hmm. followers, you know, it grew up with that. But, you know, that generation you talk about in 16 to 35, you know, they were lucky they missed the majority of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I think it's just a I think it's just a party culture now. You know, yeah. I just think okay. it's okay. my, like I have, I have a son, he's 18 and he's just started going out and and he said like when he goes out he's my, his heart is on his mouth and because of the, mm. the amount of drugs that's out there you know so mm. i think it's um mm. there is as a look said you know every everywhere there is great and it looks it's pitched your postcard at times and it's mm. but mm. you know deep down you know in, in the belly of everything there's there's still you know there's still things happening that shouldn't be happening yeah mm-hmm. you talked about christy there as well christy would sing a few of bobby sand songs Back home in Derry, of course, okay. and Mickey Michael Hatton and a few of them. I'm just, I'm just, le- I'm, I, I'm, I believe it or not, I'm just actually, I'm trying to learn it on the guitar. Are you trying to learn it on the guitar? Look out, Christy. I'm trying to learn it, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, I took it up years ago and I, I never good. stopped, but so, and during lockdown, right. I've taken it up again. Very so I've good. got the chorus, so I may give it to you, I may give it to you next time I talk to you. Definitely. Christy <laughs> always talks in it, doesn't he, about, about it being smuggled out of jail on a, written on the back of a matchbox or something. That's yeah, right, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> And, and that's interesting because I think that Christy, rightly so, I agree with this. Some people might disagree. It's fine. He keeps it. He keeps it alive. You know, he keeps what happened. Um, I think not in a sentimental way. You know, not in a picture postcard way. But he keeps it real. And I don't think. I believe in, you know, reconciliation. I believe in compassionate, um, I believe in empathy. So every, there's a side to everything. But I, I'm going to say that I think it's important because otherwise we're not, we're never going to learn anything, you know. I mean, it was just the other day when Lyra McKee was shot and killed. And that isn't because of something you know the government over here did or no. could be or it could it, you know so i think it's important that even if we don't like it and it makes us feel uncomfortable that we um need to keep it alive and keep talking about it because it always amazes me that the young people in ireland might not might know less about what's gone on than i would know and yep. i and i think but your mum and your dad would have lived through that. Yep. And it's incredible that you don't know, you know, why Lyra McKee might have been shot. Or you don't know why there's this government that's 
you know you can't form a government and when you did it it's a bit strange the government you're forming um and then the the troubles you know and when they when they joined forces with the tories and and i just thought oh goodness me it, it, so that's why it's important that history is important but i think there needs to be an honest history mm. that that warts and all you know there's well, no it has to be. dressing Absolutely, it up and it? saying you know you can go to the peace wall for example in belfast which i've done and by the way is incredibly moving and there's everything there you know it's a palestine it's a, it's a, it's a, there's pictures of nelson mandela you can't move without seeing nelson on every mural but you walk through anders town and you just think but this the flats this is where it was like a it was like a war zone it's like beirut yeah. so i just think i feel i don't know where i stand on that maybe how do you feel about keeping it alive and not forgetting, but also not re-traumatizing people. You know, do you see what I mean? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's what the problem is. I think, I think people, people want to talk about it, and they want, and they, and, 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 and the majority of the of normal people from both sides of the community, you know, from the Protestants and the Catholic side of the, of the community, they all want to work together. I, I, like I work for, I work for a company that's everybody, you know, it's both sides and. We're, we're all understanding of what's going on, and um, but I think there's still that element, as, uh, you know, as you talk about the Larry McKee thing, and, and as sad as that was, one thing that that poor girl's death that it brought everybody in the city together, you know, whereas mm -hmm. that had been the '70s and '80s, you know, it would have been full out total support for it, and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it would have been, you know, this is the right thing because we're trying to do this and trying to do that. But because we had Martin McGuinness for so long in this city to trying to tell us, we've got to try and reach out to people, you know, right. and we've we've got to leave that behind us. That when when as again when when, when Larry McKee died, the outpouring of grief from everybody supporting, you know, and against the people that done this was unbelievable, you know, and everybody mm. just turned their backs on them people. And, mm. Mm. and for me, it, it, it showed that there does people here once, once they were, but you're absolutely right. You've got, we've got to talk about, it. we can't, we can't keep having one side of history, you know, our side mm. and then their side and everybody yeah. going, oh, well, this ours is more important than yours. We mm. have to get together at some stage, um, where it be the Irish Language Act or recognizing parades or whatever, you know, we're going to have to, say right we're going to have to share this you know it's a small mm -hmm. place we're going to just have to get around the table talk about it and everybody come together our ways it's going to be an hour hundred years before we mm. before we look at it and go you know here we go yeah. again you know do you know what we're here half an hour we haven't mentioned football yet so we better, right. we better talk we better wondered, talk a little bit of football i, I could see martin was starting to get itchy he was like when when can we talk about when Liverpool? Talk football i even have when, my legs will top on tonight and fishy <laughs> in the winter. yeah when can we mention liverpool when can we mention uh, let's get to the serious stuff no it's it's uh it's well obviously you know liam you're 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 well known you're well respected you're you know you're you're uh you're a legend on 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 uh in Derry. Uh, by the foil, you know, and uh, your career, although short in terms of the injury, uh, probably stunted a lot by that injury. But you know, when you did play, um, you know, you you left your mark. Your your debut, I think, you you scored a hat trick on your debut. I did I scored a hat trick on my debut against Cove Ramblers. Come on a sub. Come on a sub for a good friend of mine, Joel Larkin. Right. And I uh, managed to get a hat trick, and that's sort of what kicked it all off for me, you know. Well, Derry City ways, I mean, who you know, playing senior football. Right, that was your introduction, and that was a good way to sort of introduce yourself on well, the screen. Well, that, yeah. You know, it, 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 changed, it changed my life, you know, Martin, up here, because as I say, you know, Derry had just been on the league two or three years, you know, as you know yourself, League Ireland football, you know, you, you would have probably seen Fun Hearts playing or whoever, yeah. you know, around yeah. me. It was dour, it was drab, you know, it was the league was going nowhere. And all of a sudden, then I get back on the league and they're bringing 10,000 people to the games, mm -hmm. you know, full of colour, full of life. And yeah. the 80s, as a stay, you were still in the middle of the trouble. So this was an escape for everybody. And by the time mm -hmm. I got my way on the, the Derry first team, you know, it was just starting to really, really tick off, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, 
it was it was a brilliant time for for me, like you know, and, it brought and, it brought that real feel good factor to the city as well, didn't it? Absolutely, and just brought everybody together, you know, and uh, you know, it was it was and it was a it was a cross community thing, you know. You had people coming from the water side who used to watch there in the sixties, um, people coming right. from you know. Uh, Protestant estates and, and areas because you just love football, right? And it, it, it brought everybody together for you know for a short period of time. They're actually doing a film about it now, I believe it or not. Okay, right. They're, they're doing a film about it from 1985 to 90. Um, I just spoke to yeah a fellow the other day, the, the producer of it, okay. and they said it's, it's going to be a big thing, like you know, because you know Derry had come from or Derry, Derry were coming from our country playing in our jurisdiction. Mm. So you know it was it was the first club I think in in, in world football to do that. Mm. So um you know so it was absolutely fantastic. Like it was great times and yeah. you know mm. I wish I could go back in time and do it all over again. Yeah. And there was trophies yeah. as well. The, the trophies were coming as well. And well we we, we we won the well, my first season we we won the league cup we won the the league and we won the FAA cup. So yeah. we're we're still the only team in history the league yeah. has to do that. Yeah. So thirty, it's thirty, it was thirty-one years now this year. Yeah. So it's still going, you know, and that even after all this stuff about Dundalk and Shamrock Rovers over the last four or five years, they still haven't managed to do the trail. Still haven't eclipsed that. <laughs> no. You you wandered away from Derry a couple of times, and there was a few other clubs uh, that you went to, but you always seemed to be drawn back to Derry. You came back to Derry a couple of well, times. Well, well, the year the year after we we won the trail, Martin, I got a bad injury. I was believe it or not, I was. I was nearly on the move. I was nearly on my way to Benfica. We played Benfica in the European Cup, and and I had I'd played two games against them uh, home and away, and I had really good game against them. Uh, Sven Goran Eriksson was the manager of them at the time, and uh, he'd made inquiries, and he said, "Look, I'll be coming back for him at the end of the season." But in between the games with Benfica, I picked up a bad injury down in Dundalk, and. Uh, it more or less finished me for about two years, you know, I was told I couldn't play again and stuff like that. And, mm. and it just sort of, you know, it was just starting to find myself and I got that injury and it just knocked me for six, really, like, you know what I mean? So, and then I, I just came back playing again then and eventually I found my way back to Derry again. Was Peter, Peter Eccles, if I remember reading rightly, that... Uh... Peter Eccles was tackled, was the tackle, Peter Eccles. Put yeah. me down and done back. Now, you know, I spoke to Peter about it after it, you know what I mean, years after it, and we've, we've had a few run-ins before that, but it was, that's the way the league Ireland was, you know yourself, eh, Martin, like you, you had to kill somebody to get a yellow card, you know what I mean? Yes. You know, it's not like now where footballers are touched and they're, they're yeah. rolling about, you, you had to actually physically kill somebody to get yes. the referee even to give you a foul. And, mm. uh, Passions was, were high as well, Liam. Uh, well, that's right, we were playing Dundalk, there are our rivals, a big game, and, mm. He can send has maybe a tackle. Right. Now the, the tackle was was you know it wasn't bad at the time, but it done a bit of damage to the knee. You know. You did get a wallop back at him later on. I think if I read. I did. I, I did. I, I played against him in a couple of years. Like, I'm not. I'm not saying revenge is for, for any young players <laughs> out there. Revenge is never a good thing. Like you know what I mean. But, Were you but, carrying? Uh, I, played, you I played against him in the Brandywell. I well, it was one of my first matches back when I came back, DJ. Yeah, and uh, he was playing for Shamrock Rovers at the time, and mm. he, me and him. I mean, Liam, about... I, I read that you just you came back, you strapped up your knee and played through immense pain. Yeah. Is, is that right? Yeah. So you didn't have the traditionally what would happen now. It well, not traditionally what would happen now in the modern day. There'd be the cryotherapy, wouldn't there? There'd be the the there'd be the extensive surgeries, the keyhole surgeries and things like that. So well, I got I, I got the keyhole and I went to Hull Hull at that time where the the top knee surgeon in England. Right. So they taken me to Hull. They they opened me up on the keyhole. There was a bit of bone floating about my knee. So right. they took that they took that out and they told me, right. Because it was a condition, it wasn't really an injury. It was more a condition, an arthritic right. condition was, was was occurring in my knee. So they basically said to me, look, if you keep playing, you're going to end up in a wheelchair. You're going to leave yourself crippled for life, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so I went, I went to France, I went to Germany, I went to America, 
and I went back to England again. And every doctor told me that you're never going to play again. You're never going to play. And this is that this, you need to stop. So basically I stopped, you know, and, and my mother, God rest her, at the time she was, she was heartbroken more than anything. You know what I mean? She was, I was like 21, 21. And I was still living at home at the time. And, and, uh, she, uh, she was heartbroken and she, she used to be putting pottery peel petals and, rubbing mats on me and stuff like this and all you know what i mean and putting prayers on my knee and stuff you know what i mean and mm. and all this stuff and and, and, and I, I haven't i haven't told this story in quite a long time and people don't don't really believe me when i say this there was a woman up here called betty Beals. betty died here not so long ago and everybody used to go there because she, she was believed that Paddy appeal was on mm. her Mm. Paddy Peel and she'd seen Paddy Peel and stuff like this. And I was I'd been I'd been all over the world, the doctors, and I went to my mother said and I went just to please my mother because I was fed up last time there, you know what I mean? She said, Look, Betty Beals wants to see you, she wants to talk to you and blah blah blah. So I said, Right, okay, I'll go. At this stage my head was in the clouds, like you know what I mean? I was mentally I, I was totally gone, like you know, at this stage. And this was after about a year I'd been out. So I went and seen Betty. And she put her she put her hands on my knee, and feel something bang me, you know. So she said, "Look, you'll be okay. You'll be all right. This will this will go away. This will leave you. You know what I mean." Mm. And about three months later, a bit of bone broke off my knee again. So I'm done the Anthony Galvin. They took the bone out, and I was back playing football within a year. After doctors telling me that I couldn't play and couldn't do this, so. Mm. I'm not saying this is real, but for for you know for me at the time, who was, I was really going through a bad bad period at mm. that time. Well, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just talking about that a little bit because I've always believed, um, I, I've always wanted to go into mindfulness based um, performance enhancement, so sports psychology. I never get round to it because I just get caught up with doing trauma and stuff like that. But they say the battle is won, the, the, the game is won, not the battle, the game is won in the head. Yeah. That it's not won, skills is great, you know, and training is great, and fitness, obviously, stamina, all this, eating the right food, laying off the wagon wheels, stop going to the nightclubs. But they say the game is won, the match is won in your head. So do you think that Betty... And by the way, the laying on of hands, my grandmother, I don't mm -hmm. mind telling you this, I, I don't talk about it a lot, but my grandmother did this, was healing by the laying on of hands. So, and I've seen it work. So, but do you think the battle and the game and the match is one in the head or is it one in the body? You know what thing about, and I've thought about this so many times because I had to, I had to go back playing I, I, my, 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 there was always that chance that my body was going to break down again, but I had to do it for my own mental strength. You know what I mean? Because I would rather my body broke down than my mind. You know, because right. at that, at that, at that stage, my mind was was really struggling for for a, nearly sixteen months. I was really struggling. Um, couldn't sleep it was struggling with me. and looking back on it he didn't know you had depression you know what i mean he doesn't realize it because everybody's said oh, I'm, I'm depressed looking back on it now, i did like you know what i mean and i, and I, and I, and I only realized i believe it or not when i done the counseling course with martin when we're doing that mm. i only realized at the end that that's what i had like you know what i mean and that's what, what i suffered with but i felt let me see like when, when I all this happened with the knee with, with Betty, and she told me it was okay. It was like somebody lifted something out of my head and just mm. went right, put that there now. It wasn't mm. so much my knee; it was my head more than anything. Mm. And at that, I came back with a knee band on, big bandage on, and and uh, I wasn't able to train the same way as I used to train. Um, I wasn't able to move the same way as I used to move because the knee restricted me, but. The fact that I was able to just put on a pair of football boots and go out, and mm -hmm. I always felt that, you know, if if my knee goes, it goes. 
You mm. know what I mean? At least, at least I'll, uh, it'll go game that uh, I'm trying. Mm. But touch wood, you know, that was nine. Uh, it was ninety one. I had the, the last operation on my knee, mm. and I went come back playing again ninety two, and I played in for another twelve years with no mm. no side effects. I is, bear with me on this question. I've just got a quick question there, and I know we've got other things that we need to move on to, but I'm always been intrigued by this, which is was football was being a football footballer who you were or what you did? Because I wonder if your loss, the grieving and the depression was because you looked at yourself not as a person who played football but as a footballer that it was your identity because sometimes I think if people lose you know when you think it's a bit like say if I instead of saying I'm a therapist it's a profession I think it's a vocation and it's yeah. who I am if I can't do that anymore if somebody said to me tomorrow right you got no more client you can't see anyone anymore you, that's it you got to go find something else to do if I think of it as a vocation, I'd be I'd be shot to pieces. I wouldn't know who I was, what I would do, and nothing would mean anything anymore. So do you think that you thought football is what I do on a Saturday or training on a Tuesday night? Or did you believe I am football? I am a footballer? Yep, absolutely. At that age, I just felt that's what I was. You know, and I just felt that it was just taken away from me. And I was more or less just cast aside, and, and 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 people look at you differently. You know what I mean? Because you know when when you're when when you're in the public eye, the way I was at a young age, and then all of a sudden it's taken away from me, and you can see people don't look at you the same way. You know, people go, ah, "That used to be. He used to be. He used to be a footballer." Yeah. You know, and that's that's the way it was. But I know what you mean. When I was younger, I just I did genuinely think, you know, I'm the employer, I'm a footballer. That's basically it. Mm. But once I started having my family, and mm. as I get older, I realised it was more than that, you know. Mm. I realised I was, I was more of a person, a more more full rounded person. But from what I've read, actually, your legendary status was more enhanced when you came back and played on a very painful knee than you were before that. Yep. Yeah, and that's incredible to me. You you played a testimonial, did you? You yep. played at your own testimonial, and then you mm -hmm. played professionally after your testimonial. After yeah, it's, nobody does that. Once no, they've no, had no, the no. testimonial, they go. But you came back and played more matches after. Well, after after that, it was. Uh, oh, there's no question about it. Like I think from, from uh, the, 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 and there's always this thing about the testimonial. I I didn't want that testimonial. I didn't want to stop playing. I was 21 and I was sort of being led by our people, you know, were telling me, this is what you have to do. This is, and, and I wish I had been stronger at the time, you know, and they say, no, I'm, I'm going to, I'll, I'll tough this out and I'll see what happens. Right. But I was led down that road and, and, and instead of following, should, should have followed my mother. She was the one kept saying, you're not doing it, you're not doing it. But, and, and, and I don't want to name names or I don't want to, because I don't, I don't hold grudges. I don't have no access to crime to anybody. But I think um, when I came back to play again, you know, I had that big blue knee band on, you know, and everybody refused to go right off. You know, you're not, you're not able to do this. But I come back a better player. I actually come back a better player because it was more mature. Mm. It was, um, you know, and that's I where I think the battle. I think I went the through a battle. Won. The, yep. the match is one in your head. Yep, the match absolutely. is not one in, and yet so many teams, I don't know how you feel about this, they've got young ones, they're playing them younger and younger, and yet they won't play, obviously not Premier League, who've got 50 billion quid for sports psychologists, but at League One, Championship, League One, League Two, the National League, the sports psychologist is almost like the add-on. You know, you're much more likely to pay for the, for the fellow who carries on your Gatorade or whatever they're drinking or whatever then you are the sports psychologist. And I sometimes sit there thinking, you've got this lad here and his only issue is in his head, not in his yeah, yeah. feet. But, 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 but and people, you know, at that time, people didn't understand it. You know, they didn't understand it. He, he could have been suffering from mental, 
you know, fatigue or, you know, you, you know, if you went out, you play a match and, you know, your body might have been good to go, but your mind was tired and, and that affected your performance. Hmm. And managers and coaches didn't realise that. All they see was you having a bad game. Right. All they see is you, oh, he's not trying today. They don't see what hmm. makes you tick and what the wheels go around in your head, especially sports people, you know, because I, I found it, I found it very difficult as I got older playing wise because the pressure on me was mountain and mountain and mountain all the time, you know, because people expect more and more off you. And, and then once you have a bad game, you know, managers don't understand. They just go, right, change him for him. Mm. That's the way it is, you know, mm. and especially as you talk about young people now, you know, it's like a conveyor belt mm. because there's so many playing now. And if one just doesn't do it, they go, right, we'll see what he's like now. See what mm. he's like. It's like yeah. a supermarket, sorry. Yeah. You know, they just yeah. move them along and they don't see the impact. And, and I'm sure it's different now. I'm sure England, when, when I went to England to play football in the early 80s, it was, I'm not joking, I was at Nottingham Forest when Brian Clough was there. Uh-huh. And all you were, all, all the coaches did, all, all the coaches did, the young players, was shout at them. Mm. Roar and shout and, mm. you know, not knowing the impact that, that was having, that, that could have on you, like, you know, so mm. I, um, I just find, you know, I, I think you've got to, people have got to start to understand. I think in my time, people just didn't understand, you know, right. they think you're injured, that's you done, look after yourself, you know, wouldn't happen now. Mm-hmm. There'll be somebody to help me along. And, and Derry, and Derry, after that, I think, learned a few lessons from it. Right. I just going to say, I never I never had the hands-on approach from Betty, but I, I would put a lot of stock in Padre Pio and on my own journey and, and would certainly be a great believer. Back to, back to football, maybe, for a minute or two. Um, and the second part, maybe, of your career when you came back. It's probably when you scored two of your most memorable goals. Um, the strike against Athlone in '95 uh, was it? Was it a was. Bit, was a bit of a cracker, wasn't it? It was. Sorry. Um, Unfortunately, we lost the league that day. We lost the league that day. I we lost the league in the last day of the season, but uh, I a scored goal. a goal that day, and, it, um, and you know, I remember fella playing with me, Stuart Gold. He missed a the penalty. They won us the league. Right. That yeah. day, and Stuart, I mean Stuart in the dressing room after, it, and he was in tears. He's one of the best players I ever played with. Right. You know, Absolutely, Scott's fellow play, lives here now. And uh, Stuart said to me, I'm really sorry, Liam, because that goal of yours is good enough. They won any league. Any league, yeah. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, it just, it just couldn't get us over the over the line that day, but I was disappointed that day. But the yeah. Another one, I was I was talking to a mate the other day, and he was asking me, to, I was saying I was going to be doing a, a chat with you, and he was asking me, did you ever play for Harps? And I had to think about it, you know. I, said, I remember he scored a goal against Harps in, hmm. in uh, extra time to put, put Harps down. And you broke the ball of Bay Hearts a few times, but that, that, then you did. You have you did play for Hearts. For, for, for I was up at Hearts for a year. I was right. up at Hearts for a year. Right. Uh, I was up uh, in eighty. I think it was eighty seven. I was up. Um, I was still only an amateur. That it was still right. amateur amateur forms. Then Martin you didn't sign unless right. you were getting paid. You know. Yeah. We were, were still an amateur, so I went up to Hearts for a year. Brent Bradley, the legendary Brent Bradley, was my reserve team manager. Okay. And uh, me and Brenton had, had been playing well together. Brenton was still playing. Yes. I was about 37, 38 at the time. And I was only 19, you know. Mm-hmm. And me and Brenton were playing up front for the reserves. And I think by the time I got on the, the, the first team, at, I think it was around November, December, Brenton scored about 25 goals and I scored yeah. about 10. Mm-hmm. I was just laying them on, and Brenton and and the manager Chris Rutherford wanted Brenton to play, but Brenton said, "No, I'm not playing. Play him." Okay. And I'm on the first team, so yeah. so I went up and I, I, I don't know, okay, I scored a couple of goals, you know what I mean, but I wasn't I wasn't ready for I wasn't ready for it, and and Fran mm-hmm. Fran Fields a great Fran, Fran Fields, Fields, yeah, yeah, tried to tried to persuade me to stay at the end of the season, yeah. but. Yeah, but that stage I knew Gary were snuffing around me, so I was going to make a return home, you know. But that, 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 that but I scored a few. Hearts were always one of them teams. Then when I played against, I always seemed to score. Yes, you know, and yeah. and, and and that was the thing. The Hearts fans used to give me a bit of stick, even though I played with them, like you know. Right. Well, should that be expected? You'd expect that. You oh, you wouldn't expect nothing else, is right. <laughs> you spent a short term at, at Glen Torn as well at the Glens. At that. You weren't at too that. happy there, I don't think. 
I went I went in ninety five. I, I just won I just won the player of the year, the Irish player the League Ireland player of the year, the Opal player of the year, the Soccer Raiders player of the year, um and uh, something else, I can't remember what it was, four trophies in a space of about six weeks. Right. And you get on I get on the thing when then the manager wants to sell me, you know. Right. Yeah, they were having a few money problems at the time and the manager at the time just you know, was it doesn't it doesn't go about it the right way, you know what I mean, so to speak. So I ended up me and him at a fallout and I ended up playing torn um came on for me. Mm. And uh I found it tough, I have to say Martin, I found it really tough. You know I, mean? I, t- I found it tough go, go leaving Derry, they they go up because I was I was at, I was playing the best football of my life and mm. I found myself playing at a team, you know, um I didn't want to be at and uh not that now looking back on it, I made some great friends out of it, and mm-hmm. we ended up winning the Irish Cup that, right. that season. I was there, so it, it was successful enough. But um, you know, I found it tough. Really, I found it tough mentally more than anything. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, it was an hard time. I struggled through through me football. Every, you know, the, the, the thing about the football is it's it brings you great enjoyment and it brings you great. Uh, mm. Excitement and and everything that goes along with glamour and stuff like that, you know what I mean. But there's, there's a real struggle behind it at times to get there, you know. And that, and that was one of the times that that struggle. Mm-hmm. Was there is there was there a kind of a macho culture in there as well back in your day where you know you didn't kind of show any maybe you know unwellness or or depression or any of those things? Or did you just battle through on your own? Well, that, that's that's it, Martin. He, he couldn't he, he couldn't show weakness. Mm. In the dressing room, you know, is that yeah. as you say, that macho background, and you know, there there was there was times that I was used to be sitting, like you know, in the, in the dressing room. Um, after you know, after maybe we were bit, and, and you felt as if it was your fault, and you're sitting there, and you're you're absolutely tearing yourself to pieces because you think I should have done this or should have done that. You know what I mean? Not realizing mm. that it's a team game and. There's other people there, but I, I I had such high expectations of myself at times that that made probably that the uh, uh, it just sent me over the age at times where 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 I thought about it too much, you know. And um, so as I say, it was only as you get a bit older you start realizing like, I, you mm. know, it's just this is not all on me at times, like you know. Mm. What year was what, what sort of sorry, Mark? What 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 sort of manager do you think? I mean, I've got my own views on this because to, in order to get the best performance out of someone, I personally don't think that that kind of manager, you talk about Brian Clough. I mean, I mean I'd mean, i probably burst into tears if he even looked in my direction, God love him. Um, you know, and then you talk about managers that are more nurturing and, and things like that. So we had our own issues at um, Wimbledon where we had a terrible downturn and we had a manager called Neil Ardley, who was who used to play for Wimbledon. Yep. And he had an approach which I really respected. And he was highly respected by his players. Then he lost the dressing room because basically the players started saying, yeah, people, we're, we're, we're not performing. And people are saying it's because you're not showing this kind of very aggressive Passion. leadership and this yep. sort of thing. So then bless him we had so much trouble it was like a trauma it was like eastenders every week and then we got wally wally downs who Thank came you. crazy gang he came with his own rep he came with a certain way of being and it was said it became known wally doesn't take any crap from anybody wally's mm-hmm. more likely to be the one throwing a football boot at you whereas neil Ardley's more likely to put an arm around you so here's my question very rambly question sorry liam no you're right who would you have who would you have responded who would have been your preference that would have got the best out of you um well i i always like i, I never like my for me managers are roar and go and shout and that i think it's all for show to be quite honest you know what i mean i think i think managers that have to do that are are, are inadequate in what they do you know what i mean i think you look at Gareth Southgate at the minute with the England squad. Yeah. You know, thoughtful, you know, quiet spoken. You never hear the players talking about or saying anything about him. 
Mm. Now, and then you have Roy Keane and the other thing, you know what I mean? I love Roy Keane, I must I love say. love Roy Keane as a pundit, but could you imagine playing for him as a manager? No. no he would, he would, him and Martin O'Neill, can you imagine? The two, we were just be, talking about this. Absolutely, you would be afraid to tie your boots wrong. You know what I mean? It's like the horseman of the apocalypse um, coming absolutely. for you. Absolutely. And I, I think football football has moved on to such a degree now that, you know, you, you look, like, well, let's be honest, not every football manager is, some players don't like managers, some players love managers. You know, I didn't always like managers I played with, but my the players I played with loved them. So, you know, and it was vice versa at times, you know. So I think a good manager will always find a way to bring everybody together. I think, you know, and get under that thinking where, you know, this is all about the team. This is not about one player or two players. Mm. You know, there was mm. managers I, I played for would have singled me out because they thought I wasn't doing enough. But somebody who wasn't as good a player as me, he would have made, he would have said, "Oh, he's a better player than him because he does more running than me." You mm. know what I mean? But he couldn't have spoke to me about it because he felt ah, it's a waste of time. You know that I. So I think managers, you know, my first manager I had at the age, Jim McLaughlin. McLaughlin, yeah. God rest Jim. Jim's, Jim suffering with dementia at the moment. You know what I mean? So Jim was very thoughtful in what mm. he done. Jim just had to say a quiet word. He, you know, mm. Jim never ever came and said to me, I need you to do this, do that, do A, B, C. Mm. Jim just used to come and say to me, I just want you to enjoy yourself playing football. Mm. And no, I used to do that. I was good. I was like 10 feet tall, you know, and mm. I think, you know, I think managers, I think managers now are becoming more, you look at Klopp and you look at Guardiola and, well, not everybody likes Klopp, not everybody likes Guardiola, but you very rarely hear stories come out of the dressing room about them. Mm. And that's how I know yeah. they're good managers see yeah. when things have been said and everybody has a story about managers and then you know that these problems in the dressing room and that's a, that's a thing like managers they made roar and like I know Alex Ferguson but I think Ferguson as he get a bit older realised I have to change my ways here you mm. know and that's how good a manager he was mm. rather mm. than just he put away just, the hair dryer stayed the same way the whole way through he put away the hair dryer uh, absolutely <laughs> yeah. Martin you know what I mean I was never yeah. one for a hair dryer <laughs> Come here, Martin O'Neill. Um, he's an old boy of the tech like ourselves. He went to the tech, didn't he? As far as I know. Um, Martin that down down at Thingley. Do you know him? Do you know him at all? Do you know him very well, Liam? Or have? I've met him a couple of times. Right. Did I've met him a couple there? of times. I don't I don't know him well, but I've met him a couple of times. Did you see there very recently where he has an objection in with the Donegal County Council? Did you see that? Seen that. We're seen that. A wee, pitch, a wee pitch in Dunfanaghy, and he he opposed to it on. Uh, I think of grounds about wildlife or something that was going to be impacted. Or, or <laughs> uh, that's right. I just thought it was quite ironic that uh, former uh, manager of the Republic of Ireland didn't want the young lads having a having a pitch. Having a pitch. Know. Yeah, uh, I thought that was a tad ironic. You know. Well, that's 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 it. When I see when it comes to money, Martin, then it's <laughs> different story, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it you, is. you mentioned Jim McLaughlin there, and I did read that he would would have been one of the most. Uh, Powerful influences on you in terms of being a manager and a man. Uh, the best player you've played with, I think you, you, you've been uh, quoted as saying Felix Felix Healy would have been probably one of the best you've played yep. with. Yeah, Felix Felix was Felix comes from the same part of the town as me, Martin and Brandwell. He he comes from the front of the, where the Brandwell is, and I come from the back. Of, and uh, Felix growing up, Felix is about 11 years older than me, you know what I mean? Right. So Felix, they all us. Growing up in the Brandywell had a big influence on everybody, especially around Derry, that, that generation. You know, before before Felix, he had Jobby Cross and the Fuller and and people yeah. like that. You know, and then Felix came after that. Felix and Kevin Mahan, who was also my manager, Derry. Um, Felix was just it was just a, Felix played in the '82 World Cup as well too. You know what yes. I mean? So yes, I remember so that. um, it was just oh, it was just a fantastic football, Martin. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And he just taught me. Playing ways, he taught me a lot, you know what I mean? Because before that, there, you know, League Ireland was a lot of, you know, just rough and tough and mm. tackles flying on. But Felix was very cultured in what he'd done, you know, and made you realize, you know, where they run and how they, you know, what way they play the ball. And for me, growing up, to get a chance to play with him in the same patch, you know, because he was, he was an idol of man's, a hero of man's growing up, you know, so oh, absolutely yeah. brilliant player. Yeah. If you, if you had an opportunity, past or present, I know it's a very difficult question and it's hard to compare, to compare players of different eras, but if you had a choice of anyone, you know, if you were given the opportunity to play with any one player in your career, who would that be? 
Oh, King Kenny. King Kenny. I love it. I love Absolutely. it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> My boyhood idol. Yes. Boyhood yeah. idol. Play, we played we, we play in a tournament in Dublin in 97, a four-team tournament. There was Celtic, were Celts, because we won the league. Yes. Um, Celtic, Newcastle, and PSV Eindhoven. Yes. So they paired us with Celtic in the first match, thinking Celtic were going to beat us. And Newcastle played PSV because they, they wanted the Newcastle Celtic final. And yes. we beat Celtic. We beat Celtic in the match. And then, so we played Newcastle, and, and Kenny, was, Kenny was the manager. Right. Newcastle, and at the end of the match, he name checked me in a in an interview, you know. Nice and I was one. standing with Matt after it, and we were all standing getting photos. And I said, I and I like I was twenty eight at the time, Martin. I couldn't even talk to him. You start couldn't even see. I couldn't even say hello. Like he's wow. just. But for me, Dagley's was Dagley's was just a, a great. You know, the United fans talk about best and. Ronaldo and but for me like you know and I know, I know that like my young boy he's 18 he's Liverpool man and Steven Gerrard says here hero yes. but oh. but for me Dag Leach is, is the yeah. all-time hero and he's the one player I would love to have had the chance to line up with you know great mm. player yeah and I had the privilege of seeing him playing a number of times a few times actually and uh never met him actually but uh, I would love to have met quite a few of the legends but uh yeah, Anouk. Well, they always say never meet your heroes, not right? No, well, but look, he... he uh... Well, I mean, I've got my own Dalgleish story. It's very interesting. So five what? years ago, I think it was 2015, they came for the FA Cup to King's Meadow to play AFC Wimbledon. And of course, we held them off and then we were we were put to the sword by Steven Gerrard in the in a perfect curving free kick. He didn't even, you know, didn't even mm. touch the sides. But I remember sitting there and he, so we were in the directors and he was in the away directors and there he is, he's looking like, you know, he's a very serious man, that Kenny Dalglish. <laughs> and I was getting so frustrated at this point and I just stood up and said, come on lads, they're just a jumped up tram mare. <laughs> and the look, the, and I thought, oh, he's not going to look at me bad, I'm a, I'm a lady, he won't look at me like that. <laughs> the look he gave, I thought, imagine if you'd been, you know, coming up against Kenny Dalglish at some point in your life, you'd have thought... Yeah. Now there's a man who just has this presence with his look. He yeah, really does. does. He does have a presence. You're absolutely right. He has a real presence. Incredible about him. presence. He's got a wicked sense of humour as well. He's got an absolute. He but I, I, I was at a about '95. Martin, I was at an awards do in Dublin, and I'm stuck at the table, his table, and at one side of me is Dag Leash, the other side of me is Franz Beckenbauer, Sabio's oh. um, across the table. The full mm. Ireland teams there, and I'm sitting, and and I and I they're all around me, and Beck and Byron, the whole lot, and all I could do was just stare at Kenny Dalglish. It was like mm. a stalker, you mm. know what I mean? I was going, he wow. doesn't catch me looking at him here, like you wow. know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, he was, uh, you're right, you know, he, he was he was very friendly that night as well too. Like, yeah, yeah. Mm. Do you remember? Do you remember Liam the Le the Legends game up in Derry? That's about yeah, ten or eleven. Well, the one was over over the Institute. Ah, over the Institute. Yeah, yeah. It was a few of the a few of the old boys over for that. I remember. That's right. Uh, That's right. Did you, score, did you score that night? I scored that match. Scored I, that night. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. I, who was in goal? Point. Who who was in Liverpool goal? Who was in the I well, in the uh, legends? Uh, Rob Boulder. I think, I think it might have been Mike Hooper, was it? Like, uh, I think Grobler was there as well. It wasn't Grobler? Grobler was. I don't think Grobler played that night. He was there, but I think it was Mike. I think it was Mike Hooper was in Nets. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, they were they're, they're good guys. The Liverpool fellas. I met them a, a, a couple of things. You know, we played them a couple of times, and a really, really friendly bunch. You know, yeah. And uh, nice to talk to and stuff like that. You know, because it's it's you and you're, me and you. Have, have, you, have you any contact? Them, have you any contact with them? Because and everything, um, Martin. You know, I'm hoping to do a cast when when we eventually win the league game, which will be a week or two's time. Have you any contacts for any of the old boys? We get them on. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, not. I think oh. I think they all ran away from me, Martin. Have you not got Kenny, have you not got Kenny's number? <laughs> I, had him from, I had it from 23 years ago, but I think he's changed it. <laughs> uh, uh, Jesus, wouldn't it be great to have Kenny on, would you? Uh, oh, dear. Oh, man. Oh, man. I mean, do you, I, I just want to say, it must be, I mean, you, you must have at some point, even though you had highs and lows, do you, do you, I mean, this is what I'm feeling, so I'm feeling something here, but I, I would have, what I would do, I would love to have done what you did. Just the the life you had, the career you had, the the ups and downs, the the moments that you would rather forget, and the moments that you'll never forget. You know, I just think it must be great just running out onto the pitch and being that guy. You were 
that guy you are to some to many people still that guy you know um do you know what the thing, see what you said and that there's you can't you can't have highs without lows you know especially in sport it's just impossible you know what i mean and, and you know for everything i've gone through you i've become a far better person for it all i have to say you know what i mean i've become and that that course you know that that only martin really really opened my mind to things you know and because i i just lost my father that time we, we done that was that year wasn't it liam and, uh, yeah I, I was, only, was only there a couple of months, Martin, mm. when, when I done that course. And that course mm. just opened my mind to the, the things that's important in life. You know what I mean? I, like, I had every intention of doing with this man down here, but he had more discipline than I had. You know what I mean? Money got in the road of my, <laughs> my dreams. Uh, I was hoping but, you'd follow but, on, you know. But, but the, the one year, you know, and I, it, just, it just made me realize, you know, that not to be too hard on yourself, but look back on things. And enjoy it, you know. And, and I can look back on things now, you know. And and and, and I look at I look at as I'm getting a wee bit older every year. I'm starting to look at things, you know, mm. but more lighter than I used to. I used to think, you know, I should have done this or I should have done that. I don't think like that anymore. I think like you know, that was good. You know what I mean? That does what it's mm. supposed to be. So I, I remember every, that everything time. was brilliant. Yeah, I remember that time as well. You were planning. If I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were planning to bring that counselling, those counselling skills you were you were, you were, you were learning and time to bring that on to work with young people if i remember rightly yep. and and I, I you know i figured that was the way you were going to go but obviously you've used those skills since in working with people i'm sure okay you know even, even the way you, even the way you talk to people and martin now you know what i mean and the way mm. you know before before i'd have been about closed off with people you know and mm. you know and I, said, like, I don't really want to talk to you about things now or you know do things like that but after that there realize like people want to talk to you because they're they're interested in you and mm -hmm. you know they, they want to hear what you've got to say you know and rather than just not not be dismissive but you know say i haven't got the time to do it now maybe mm -hmm. a bit more relaxed about you know being a yeah. bit more kinder and, yeah. mm -hmm. and and a bit more aware of what people yeah. you know, just want to do to you or want to talk to you about great i, w I would describe you as a, as a kind of modest unassuming superstar i would that fit well, uh, modest and assuming, I don't, don't know about the superstar, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's, yeah, I'm, defi that's... I'm definitely, I'm definitely, I'm definitely modest, you know, yeah. until, until I'm up in the karaoke or having a pint or something, you know what I mean? But, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, 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 I just, I, I just talk it all on my stride, Martin, you know what I mean? I just, yeah. I think, you, I think you've got to, especially in Derry, where everybody knows one another, you can't, you can't get a book your station here, yeah. like, you know what I mean? You'll be taken We're down all, pretty quick. Oh, well, that's that's it. You know what I mean. And and and, and as, as going way back to the start, of this, we we we've all went through enough in this town without people yeah. thinking they're yeah. they're actually better than what they are. You know what I mean. You, mm. you, everybody's trying to help each other at some yeah. stage. You know. Yeah. We can. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that as a professional footballer, you got paid to do something. You got paid to do that. Yeah. You know, and there's not many people that get or got get paid to do to play football mm. i think that's a, a, a i'll always anybody you can play for for pin cray wanderers or corinthian casuals or you could play for liverpool i would want to sit and talk to someone and say you got paid to do mm. that you got paid to kick a football mm. you know the, the funny the funny thing about it is and i i could have made a lot more money playing for other teams you know every season there was somebody come in or would phone me, you know, there, you know, there was no agents then the way there is now. So the, the managers from our teams would have just picked the phone up and you went, right, I'm offering you such and such. And I would have said, no, I don't really want that because I'm getting enough of dairy and I'm happy and I don't want to be moving to Dublin or Belfast or, or Cork yeah. or wherever it is. Or England. Like I, in 94, when I just come back, you you remember you should probably remember too a fellow called Neil McNabb Martin yeah yeah Neil McNabb played played with me at Derry for a season one of the nicest guys you ever met but Neil was involved with Man City right um uh, he went back to playing with the the youth team in '94 I just found out all of my wife knew she was expecting a baby and uh, it was it was '93 it was right and Neil got me a trial with Man City at the time 
and I turned it down. I just <laughs> went, I said, I'm not, no, in Man City weren't, aren't the Man City they are now, but they were still a big club, you know, and they wanted me over. They said, look, I know you, yeah. they'll, they'll sign you. I said, no, it'll not make me happy. Hmm. All, I, all I ever wanted to do at that stage was just play for Derry City and, and, and you know, run out in front of my friends and, mm-hmm. and people I knew. And, and I knew that if I had went to England, I'd have been back within two months, I'd been going, this is not for me, you know. So mm-hmm. so money money wasn't really my inspiration, you know what I mean, to play yeah. football. But yeah. I know what you mean. I know it's given me a nice life, to be quite mm-hmm. honest. You yeah, I, mean? it hasn't, I, it hasn't, I would have liked to have got paid to play football. I would, I, think I would have, I would have got a trial at Derry. I would have, <laughs> I, would have, I, would have. I could do that, you know. I know you could. I, I would love it. Hello. Can you imagine? And that's why I don't understand. We talk about the big bucks that footballers earn now, and then you see them coming out and they're lacklustre and they don't and they think. You know, some of these people, I think about somebody like Andy Carroll and his broken toe. Andy Carroll is the biggest white horse, white elephant that God has ever created. And and I think you, a little boy, would give, give anything for what you've got. So I watch all the stands and I see the little, they bring the little kids. And, yeah. you know, we're a big family club, so there's always babies and people like that. And and a little boy would give anything to have run out for Derry run out for Dundalk, run out for yeah. anyone. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Carlisle, they they yeah. do anything to put the shirt on and play the shirt, you know, play for the shirt. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Absolutely. Anything. There's no there's no question about that. And the fact that, that somebody's prepared to give you like what well, the first time I played for Derry, the day I made my debut for Derry, I was handed my wages straight after the match. Twenty pound. Twenty pound. That's what it was. I hadn't even signed a contract yet, you know what I mean? I hadn't even signed. I was, I was still, still an amateur, and that's what they gave me for playing that day and scored a hat-trick. Mm-hmm. And then two weeks later, they bring me in, and they stick a professional contract on in front of me, and they hand me XXX, and I'm looking at it going, did you actually pay me to do this? Mm-hmm. You know, this is, this is great. This, this is, this is the life, you know? But as I say, I could have made more money playing elsewhere, but... I was always happy with, with, with my lot of Derry, you know. Yeah. We've drawn down to the last couple of questions, Liam. I really appreciate your time, you know. Not at all. We can't, really, we can't really talk to you about Derry City without mentioning the two lads, Mark Farron and Ryan McBride. I know Mark, he, he eclipsed your, your total goals um, before he passed. And, and then, of course, Ryan McBride a few years ago as well. Must have been a big blow to the city, both, both lads. Oh, absolutely. I think... Uh, I think Mark's Mark Mark at the start. You no, know, they they lose they lose one player at a, uh, so young at, at a football club is firstly unheard of, Mark. You know what I mean? It doesn't happen that often, but they lose two within the space of three years. Mm. You know, and uh, Mark Mark was such a lovely guy, like a nice young fellow. You know, nice. Mm. You know, I remember him coming on the team when, when I was come I was coming near the end of my career when, when Mark broke onto the team. You know, and. You're just trying to help him to get along and, and try your best to, 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 to make sure that he does okay. You know, I never thought he would have gone to do it, done what he done, obviously. Like, you know, but just, you know, uh, when, he, when, he, when he took all at the time, you know, and there was talk that he was going to beat it and stuff like this, and, and then he sadly passed away, I think. It was a massive blow for everybody, you know what I mean? And uh, just because he was just a nice guy. And obviously, Ryan was more personal to me because Ryan's father and me are best friends. Okay. You know, we grew up in the same part of the city and, you know, and, and that hit me harder because of, of the closeness of, of, of the situation be, be, mm-hmm. between us, you know what I mean? And I think that that, that week was a straight one of the strangest weeks ever in Gary when Ryan died, you know, because mm-hmm. Martin had died as well, Martin McGinnis at the same right. time. And Martin, Martin's brother, William, is Ryan's uncle by marriage. So the two families were so intertwined and what they had to go through that week, you know, it was just, it was one of the most surreal times in, in, in Derry's history, like, you know what I mean? Obviously Martin, because of who he was, and then Ryan to mm. the football, but it was just so sad. And, and you know, you know the, the stadium's named after Ryan and 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 uh, the stands named after Mark. So you know, yeah. in some small way for their families, it's still it'll be um you know 
there's at least there's something there for them they they, they mm-hmm. hold on to you know absolutely yeah absolutely what next for Liam Coyle well now, now at the minute Martin I'm, I'm babysitting my granddaughter that's my job now at the minute I'm a full time babysitter now and uh She's just taking over my life at the moment, so she has. Mm-hmm. Uh, who knows, Martin? Yeah, I, 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 I just said this to somebody a couple of weeks ago. I never planned anything in my life football ways, and mm-hmm. I think you see, just have to let the way I am. I just have to let it go. Like, you know, I mean, the the young fella plays a bit of football here too, so right. hopefully he might make steps forward and give me a give me an excuse to, to go and watch him play. Absolutely. Hope he gets a trial at Liverpool. We get we get. Some Absolutely, It'd be great, wouldn't it? He can make the money I didn't make. <laughs> wouldn't that be class wouldn't that be class <laughs> listen it's been absolutely fabulous you know you're, you're you are a legend you are a superstar and you well, more important to me you're a friend and i mean I'm absolutely sure. and and, and uh, the, the, uh, so glad i done that course so many years ago because yeah, um and made and as you say made good friends and, and yeah. more important to yourself like you know who, mm-hmm. and, and i'm so much admiration for you for what you've gone on to do you know so oh, i don't know well, I'm, a bit mad. I'm still a bit mad uh, Liam, but I always sure. what, what Donny Gaw man is and Martin, you know what I mean? This is it. But like you know, just saying, you know, again because of the because of the COVID, you know, there wasn't an awful lot of work it, it, what we were doing in terms of you know uh, group stuff or even one to one. So um, the idea of the podcasts came up, you know, and uh, and luckily enough, over the years I've, I've gotten to know people like yourself and that were that were that were interested in, in sitting down and having a chat with us. So I'm very grateful for that because uh, not at all. You're more than welcome, my friend. You know, and it's so good like to get to get a nook as well because as I say, we we got to know each other through through Christy, Christy Moore, and uh, you know the love of music, the love of football, the love of the crack, I suppose, really as well. Well, sure, maybe maybe the next time Christy Moore comes to the area, we can all meet up and that's the one that we can do that. We can definitely do that, sir. Um, Anouk, thank you again for your time. Anouk, very nice to meet you. It's, lo- it's fantastic to meet you, Liam. Uh, Martin will tell you, he tells me who we're going to plan to get on. And he said, uh, I've got Liam Coyle from Derry. And that, and I had to beg to be on this, this yeah. one. Oh, I said, I'm not bothered about, I'm not bothered about the, the T-Shock. <laughs> I'm not, bothered about, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not bothered about, you know, anyone, some, you know, low, some TD. Oh, well, of course, you know, he had Michael Healy Ray on. I was like, oh, that that fella can wait. Liam Coyle is the one that I want to. Well, look, here, here's one for you. I used to I used to go to Roehampton. Really? I with the long tour youth club in the Brandywell area. We used to take us over. So I went there from I was 14. I was 17. 13. I was 17. Four years or so. And we used to play at the pitches in Roehampton. And Wimbledon used to train there. They were, I think they were non-league at that stage. <laughs> and I used to just stand and watch them. You know, we used to go down and play and and uh, I couldn't believe it. Like, you know what I mean? Because Vinnie Jones and all were there at that time. Mm. They were all playing, you know what I mean? And yeah. it was just going. But it was great. I loved Roehampton. I loved Roehampton. Beautiful. Mm. You could have been wasn't. one of the crazy gang, Liam. Yeah. Uh, it could have been. Uh, it could have been. But you I wanted could, to stay at home. I would have fitted on rightly. <laughs> <laughs> On that, note, on that note, guys. Thank you. It's been a real privilege. Thank Pleasure. you so much. Pleasure. Nice, Talk nice to you soon, buddy. Martin, all the best. See you soon, man.